Hi, Kevin. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for joining me on the Open Job Pink Couch. Almost 18 months since you launched those shiny jets. So um, how was last winter? How are you seeing this winter? Um, you've got a lot of capacity you're throwing at the market, and I'm really very interested to see how it's being um, received on the consumer side and, of course, for the travel advisors. Well, this week we take delivery of aircraft number 38 of the Wow. Jet yep. So we are uh, very quickly adding jets. We will be at 44 uh, by the end of the year. So we are significantly larger than we were last winter. And of course, mm -hmm. that's sitting right alongside the 29-8 uh, fleet, which continues to be well served across Eastern Canada. But this winter will be very different for Porter than it was last year because we had we had just started our jet service and we were still building out our domestic service from Eastern to Western Canada and introducing core markets last year, like Vancouver, Edmonton and Calgary. And we had uh, started to introduce some Florida flying last uh, winter, but we only uh, had you know a few jets that we could deploy at that time. And so we were single daily of seven flights a day into five markets. Uh, but this year, Florida is going to be very different for Porter. You know, we are way more than doubling our capacity into Florida this winter. Uh, we will be the second largest carrier from Eastern Canada into Florida, double the size of the number three carrier to give wow. you a set of the amount of capacity. We're flying nonstop to uh, six different destinations in Florida. We're doing that from Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Halifax. The markets do vary by, by the, the departure city, but it's a significant presence that we're launching. And, you know, we've also, since we, since we did last winter, we are really growing in the Southwestern United States now. So uh, this winter, we'll also get to take folks to six destinations in the Southwest. So Phoenix, where I grew up, um, LA, San Francisco, yeah. Vegas, Palm Springs, which is really exciting. That's a fun destination. Uh, and also San Diego. So Porter is going to be all over the sun uh, in many different ways in the U.S. this winter. We're very excited. About it. Yeah, it's it's just unbelievable, the growth. I mean, you started with a couple of jets. I was there at Pearson to fly on one of the first. And, and now you are almost at 44 and you're deploying them all over the... It, I want to, I'm curious, well, I have so many questions. First of all, why Florida? Why focus on Florida? Is it the cruise market or is it really the vacation market? And are you seeing northbound um, as well? Well, out of your various U.S. Uh, destinations. Also, right. I want to know which routes are proving to be the most popular. Are you seeing a lot of trans-Canadian uh, domestic service that is filling up? Where Where are you seeing the market? Yeah, so... Um, Miami last, it's interesting, like in the cruise question that you asked, uh, Miami, of course, being the largest opportunity in the cruise area. Last year, our flight wasn't timed for cruise. And so as a result of that, if you were to ask me which market performed uh, to your expectations the least last winter, I would have told you Miami. And the reason for that was the fl slots didn't allow us to time it for cruise. This ah. year, Miami is perfectly timed for cruise. And we can already see that that market is building much, much better, much faster than it did uh, last winter. So we're very excited about it. But when you ask what the most popular destinations are, I think you have to look at where we're putting the majority of the capacity. And the two largest markets with the most capacity are going to be Orlando and Fort Lauderdale. And of course, Fort Lauderdale is cruise as well. But yeah. Fort Lauderdale is a popular destination in and, in and of itself. A lot of Canadians live there too. Uh, Fort Myers uh, in Tampa, other markets on the Western side, which have a lot of Canadians with their uh, winter homes. And so yeah. Yeah, you have your vacationers, you have your snowbirds, you have your crews, you have the standard mix. Um, but what I was really excited by was how many Florida commuters we attracted last summer, or excuse me, last winter. And I think given the schedule that we have this year with far more frequencies into these core markets, Frankly, I think Porter should be the carrier of choice for commuters into Florida. <laughs> um, so that's why Florida, it's obviously a big destination from Eastern Canada. Yeah. Lots of frequency for us, lots of winter snowbirds and people who commute. Um, you asked about the point of sale, it does vary a bit by market, but 
in the winter time, of course, it is 90% southbound. Sure. I'm not sure a lot of folks in Florida want to go to Canada in the, in the winter time. Uh, so it is very heavily balanced on the southbound. We did operate uh, Orlando and Fort Lauderdale through the summer. Uh, and it was, you know, while still majority was Canada originating, uh, we saw a better balance between northbound and southbound uh, for the uh, summer period this year. This is such a new chapter for Porter, having such an enormous network, which doesn't stop, you know, growing. I think people might have expected you to trip over yourselves in growing so fast. And that doesn't seem to be happening. And I'm curious as to why that is. Well, I think there's a few things. Um, have we had a perfect launch in every way? No. I mean, we've had some challenges, especially last year, as we were just scaling up the operation. I think we got a lot under our stride uh, to for us this year. We're really excited by the volume of, of passengers we're flying this summer. Uh, this August, so the month we're in right now, we're really pleased that we're going to have a network 85% load factor. And I'm really excited to say we're carrying 85% load factor with the highest customer satisfaction and net promoter scores that we've ever run in the summer and with those high load factors. Yeah. So yeah. that's a really great accomplishment that we're proud of. It is. But, you know, we weren't a startup airline when we started this growth. We had been around for 16 years when we started this growth. So we had systems and capability already in place. It really was about scaling it. Uh, and I think this year in 2024, we've seen a lot more success with building upon that scale that we built last year in 23. Fascinating. Love it. Um, so now I want to ask you about Ottawa. You have focused specifically on that market with certain routes. It's unusual in a way to see, because I think for the most part, you know, we look at Montreal, Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, traditional sort of gateways from Canada. And the Ottawa focus is almost like you're creating a, another hub. And I would imagine that the experience Porter had in Ottawa helped you to assess that market and the catchment area. Talk to me a bit about that. Sure. Well, pre-COVID, Ottawa was Porter's number one market. Now, obviously, post-COVID, Ottawa has changed. I mean, a lot of government still works at home. Uh, the amount of business traffic going into Ottawa is not what it was pre-COVID, uh, nowhere near what it was. But it really has created a platform for us to expand our presence in a market that was our first market we ever flew to, and was our biggest market pre-COVID. Now, believe it or not, you're gonna be blown away, I think, by this, because of your interest in the size of our operation there, we are already at 19 nonstop destinations from Ottawa, and we've managed to get there in less than 18 months. And so- wow, that is impressive. Invested, we've invested a lot into Ottawa. So let me give you some numbers to help you understand that. Um, last year, we flew 775,000 people to Ottawa. This year, it's going to be 2 million. We have doubled the number of team members that we have in Ottawa. And we've always had a Dash 8 crew base, and we now have an E-195 crew base. And Ottawa represents now 10% of all of the team members at Porter are based in Ottawa, uh, which is a pretty good number when you consider how, di how dispersed our, our, our team member base is. We were also really excited that back in, in January, excuse me, June, we opened a brand new state-of-the-art 150,000 square foot hangar at the Ottawa airport. And it holds eight aircraft and it's gonna be a maintenance base for us for the Dash 8s and the E-195. This, this um, winter, we're doing four destinations nonstop out of Ottawa. You know, that's Tampa, Fort Myers, Orlando and Fort Lauderdale. And that's in addition to the Vegas service that we're also launching this September. So. You know, every time I go to Ottawa, what we find is the local market is very appreciative of us bringing nonstop service to that market that didn't previously exist. And we really like it as a market because it's about the same catchment size as Calgary. When you think of the population size, okay. it is a good local market of business and leisure travel. I mean, obviously, the market is an affluent market. And so people travel frequently there. It's, it's, it's nice and diverse on many different levels. 
And other carriers have chosen to build their hubs in Montreal and Toronto, and therefore Ottawa's overlooked. And so as an underserved market, we can come in with, frankly, an aircraft that we also believe is the absolute right size for the market. Right. Yeah. You know, a 132-seat Embraer E195 allows you to build uh, a network and frequency into the Ottawa market, a market that the, you know, a 737 or an A220, frankly, may be too large to build frequency into that market. So. Yeah. E195, the Dash 8, perfect for that market. And we're really, really pleased with how it's doing. Uh, and we're excited for what we're going to do there this uh, this winter. Yeah. Speaking of Ottawa, I would be remiss in not asking you about the Competition Bureau study on Canadian Airlines, which is a real hot button. And we've expressed some opinions on it on Open Jaw and some of the written articles because I, I don't know that the government really understands the airline industry. I think you have to come from that side of the business to really get it, get the financial repercussions of everything that you do. Um, so, and of course the taxes is a huge issue and WestJet has been you know, very vocal about that with the airport taxes and the landing fees, et cetera. Okay. How does Porter perceive the, the study, the so-called study? Well, we're very glad they're doing it. I think it's I think it's important to understand that. I think we all agree, including the federal government, that the aviation sector is important to Canada. It's important to the yeah. movement of people and goods, is both domestically, transborder, internationally. We all agree on the value of it. Um, what I find interesting is there's a story in Canada today about how hard it is to increase competition in Canada, and you know we are a success story in Canada that just 18 months ago, we were 3% of the market. Right now we are 11% of the market and growing. And so we are demonstrating that you can compete with the duopoly of Canada if you have the right product, you have the right fares and you have the right service. And we get to do that against a, a backdrop and a brand that's established in the marketplace, but we're challenging the duopoly. So I think that's important because people want to talk about the airlines that have either failed or struggled. And I always do like to add, oh, but there is one that is doing quite well and we're pleased on what we're doing. But I'll, I'll bring it back to the point of, you know, the government view. Um, there is work they absolutely can do to make this marketplace far more competitive. I agree with our competitors about the situation of taxes, of the rents that are paid by the consumer uh, for, for airports that don't even air, support air uh, industry infrastructure, that just go into the coffers of the federal government to fund other programs. You know, if I were to give my opinion, I think too often the airline industry is viewed as an ATM. Yeah. An ATM for the government, and in some cases an ATM for consumers, because in the case of the Passenger Bill of Rights, does the government not realize what it is doing in saddling an industry with obscene compensation requirements for issues that aren't even within the airline's control? Please give me any other industry that is mandated by the government that you will compensate customers for failure. Um, whether it's your fault or not, that is millions and millions of dollars. And then imagine being an upstart airline, and that is a layer, you know, you know, onto your cost base as you're trying to get yourself established. Yeah. There's other things. So we've talked a bit about the taxes. We've talked about the passenger bill of rights, um, but they're an APPR. But there's also infrastructure, and this is something very true to Porter, because you will now see two examples where Porter has actually funded infrastructure development in Canada to increase competition in Canada. That's at the Billy Bishop Airport. When we launched nearly 18 years ago, we built that passenger terminal. Yeah. And now you see us building a passenger terminal at the Montreal Metropolitan Airport with our partners um, at that airport to help create infrastructure to support and grow competition. You can look in other airports such as Pearson Airport, it's heavily slot constrained, constrained that is biased towards the incumbents at that airport. 
where Porter wants to expand and bring more competition to that airport. Um, but the lack of availability makes that a challenge for new start carriers, whether that's Porter or others. So infrastructure is another area. Runway terminal infrastructure is another area where I think the government needs to consider how do you give access to new start carriers to be able to increase competition. And, and so those would be the areas that we've asked and shared with the federal government and what I, we hope they'll take a look at. See the passion that comes out of you when I bring this up. <laughs> you clearly have a strong opinion, and so you should. And I think everyone in the airline industry has a very strong opinion about it. Well, I was going to say, team members in the office have had to listen to me rant just on this issue about give me any other industry that has to compensate. So on, I was on the TTC here in Toronto uh, just last week, and the subway line was shut down due to a fire investigation, and I was 40 minutes late for a very important meeting. So do I get my $3.30 refunded? Do I get my $81 Uber refunded by the TTC? Do I receive $150 in compensation for being late for a meeting? No, we don't do that You know, to other industries. Why are we doing that to the aviation industry? It's a very easy target. People love it. People love to criticize airlines. It is a topic of conversation. Every time you go to a dinner or a cocktail party, everyone's going to start throwing their own version of what happened to them and how terrible it is. And, you know, the government should intervene and all the rest of it. So I really think there's a lack of education. And that's why I think for that is a good aspect of the study because it really forces all of the carriers to get together and talk and present to the government in unison and in one voice. Um, when the hearings start, I realize it's going to be each one of you separately, but ultimately you're, you're singing from the same songbook, I would imagine. Yeah, I, we obviously all have the same experiences uh, and we all work in an industry that is a very low margin business that has very high capital requirements yeah. and a return on investment needed for that capital. And as you keep saddling the industry with more and more costs, it's really hard to start up an airline it's very hard to add capacity when those are what you're trying to deal with in competing with established carriers. And yeah. As I said, Porter is a success story and we're very proud of what we're doing here. But I would certainly understand some of the other competition in the marketplace that's struggling and in some cases have failed. Thank you very much, Kevin. I have so many more questions that pop into my head, but we'll keep them for another time. It was great to talk with you and to get your perspective and congratulations. I would imagine Bob DeLuce's pinching himself because <laughs> this was his vision for years and years and I, he just must be so happy yeah he loves to see what we're doing and even more so he loves to talk to passengers and hear their level of satisfaction yeah. with what we're doing and that gets bob deluce excited so it's exciting good for you thank you very much for talking with me today kevin thank you nina as always